go ahead and get started this evening. Grab the hymn book, turn to 202, hymn 202. I will sing of my Redeemer, hymn 202. As we all stand together, we'll sing all four verses there. On that first verse together as we stand. singing this evening hymn 100 day by day hymn 100 we'll sing all three verses there on that first verse now day by day
you so much. And uh, you be seated. Will you please? Several months ago, uh, we uh, reviewed the story of the writing of that song. And uh, Lena Sandell, Carolina, uh, I don't think my friends, the Ericsons, uh, my Swedes are with us tonight. But some of our well-known songs come from that part of the world, including How Great Thou Art, the first couple verses anyway. But Sandell was in a boat riding with her father, was a preacher. And just a freak accident took place. She watched, uh, she watched him drown in a lake. And uh, she writes that song uh, out of that experience. Day by day, just day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. And uh, she taught us a, a great lesson, didn't she? To, uh, to lean upon God and just, day by, just live day by day. I read to the kids in chapel this morning, sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. In other words, just, just live for God today and trust Him and do what's right. And I hope that you've done that. If you had a good day, say amen. amen. If you had a bad day, say amen anyway. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. I hope uh, you have had a good week and uh, we're looking forward to what the Lord has for us. Uh, on the weekend, I want to re uh, remind you that uh, we're headed, of course, into Saturday and Sunday. And I want you to be faithful uh, our Saturday soul winning meeting is at 10 a.m. I hope that you'll be here. And we're meeting next door in the uh, men's Sunday school classroom there. And uh, everything will be uh, a little better organized over there. And uh, we'll meet. And everything will be prepared. And uh, then there'll be a short devotion challenge from God's Word. And then uh, everybody will be sent out. And so if uh, you can meet us here 10 o'clock next door, I hope that you'll do that and encourage you to be here with us. I want to go over uh, the missions conference with you for a moment if I can. And if for some reason, for some reason, I don't know how that I confused people. I've never done that, but uh, I did it this time. And so if you have uh, volunteered to serve as a table captain, will you raise your hand, please? Okay. Very, very good. Wonderful. Well, I have something for you maybe uh, during fellowship time. Uh, I'll give you one. This is a, a way that you can organize your table just a little bit, and then there's some brief instructions on it. And so what we'd like our table captains to do is uh, first be responsible to fill their table. So we have 16 round tables uh, at the venue and uh, eight seats per table. So including you, your spouse, if that's applicable, and then those that will be uh, seated with you. We'd also like you to provide a theme, uh, international theme for your table. So it might be Italy. And so you'd provide Italian food, or it might be China. You'd serve Chinese food. It might be Samsula. And you'll serve Samsulan food. I'm not sure what that's going to be, but uh, that's like a wild, wild game meat night or something like that. And uh, I signed off on that idea. I think that might be a little cutesy. But, uh, so you'll only provide... You'll only provide what would be enough food as you organize that meal with your table. So divide the effort. And you're only providing enough food for the eight people seated with you. Okay. Now, uh, we believe in sharing because sharing is caring. Can I get an amen right there? So, although you're bringing that international food for your table, we'll have a buffet line set up to where you can label the food that you've brought and you can share it with everybody. So everybody gets a flavor, uh, a taste of something that they would like. So, again, you have eight seats. You're providing, you're picking your own theme. Um, so you might think outside the box a little bit. Uh, some are easy. French might be somewhat easy. Thai may be somewhat, somewhat easy. Um, you may have some other ideas. And just, it's kind of up to you. Uh, so just kind of get into it, enjoy it. They will have the building open for us. They've been so kind to help us on the front end and the back end of not paying, not really paying for the hours that we can have access to the building, and I was grateful for that. So we'll have access to the building by 4.30. The tables will be set up, the chairs will be set up by that time. So if you want to come at that time and go ahead and get it out of the way until uh, you can come back and everything's ready, or if you want to show up early and do that, but they'll have it open at 4.30, and uh, the meeting starts at 7 o'clock, and uh, we need to, of course... Uh, take our trash out, and remove all our belongings by, by 9.30. So we, we'd like the meeting to be over somewhere between 
8.30 and 8.45, and so, so we'll do it that way. So here in just a moment when we stand and sing and then greet one another, uh, I'll give you one of those. I still have a few tables available, uh, and so if uh, you just want to see me here in just a minute, I'd be happy to, happy to get you a table, and I appreciate very much all the effort to, uh, to volunteer, and it's going to be great. We've kind of chosen to end our conference that way, so of course we'll have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night, and then... We'll break on Wednesday and the big, uh, the big finale on Thursday night, uh, and we'll receive faith promise commitments at that time. Uh, in the meeting, Monday and Tuesday night, uh, instead of having a meal, uh, we'll have prayer time. Uh, so 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary, if you want to come early, pray with us that God would bless the conference, you can do that. So 6 o'clock to about 6.30, 6.35, we'll just have a prayer meeting. Uh, before the meetings Monday and Tuesday night and that's a bit of a change from what we've done in the past and so I'll be standing down here in just a moment and uh, to help you and uh, I appreciate that so very much what I'd also like you to do um, and I did not put this on here but if you can maybe populate that table as quickly as you can uh, because what we want to do is take the names that you have presented we'll make place cards for your table and it will let us know how many outliers there might be or folks that will want to come but haven't been assigned yet so we can make sure those tables are full. We want everybody to come, but we want to make sure everybody's cared for the right way. So maybe the next couple weeks, if you could work hard, and you might have a fantasy draft of church members to try to get to a sit at your table. But however you want to do that, if you want to pay them, you can pay them. Uh, but uh, if you could help us with that, that would uh, that'd be a tremendous blessing. We appreciate that. So very, very much. Brother Jeremy, come if you will, and uh, just pick another song there for us, and, uh, and we'll greet one another here in just a moment. We're glad that you're here. Uh, Mr. Les, why don't you introduce the guest you have with you tonight, please? Very good. So we're glad these fellows are here, and I was talking to Leo last night. How many of you have heard of Bob Jones Sr.? Raise your hand. Well, he was in Bible college, and, and Jones Sr. was his professor and had some pretty awesome stories and so uh, brother Leo's a great soul winner and is just a just a good man and I hope that you'll come by and greet these good men here in just a moment let them know that you're glad to see them here tonight but we're glad that you're here and we're looking forward to being God's word tonight so let's stand together brother Jeremy come sing a verse or two of something and uh, then we'll greet one another tonight All right, hymn 245 the old account was settled long ago hymn 245 we'll sing that first verse there together there was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was sent.
right, as we find our seats there, we'll join together on that last verse. If you need the words, hymn 245 on the last verse together now. Oh, sinner, trust the Lord. Be cleansed of all your sin. For thus he hath provided for you to enter in. And then if you should live a hundred years below, a veil you'll not regret it. You settled it long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago. Thank you. Amen. Great, great singing. Be seated, will you please? And uh, we'll receive the offering here in... Uh, in just a moment, somebody asked about table linens. They do not provide the linens, so make sure uh, you bring. If, and if you need, if you need things, uh, just let us know. We may have it here. So uh, just just communicate with us what you need, and uh, we'll make sure we we uh, accommodate all of that. <coughs> Fellas, will you come, and we'll receive the offering. Amen. Amen. Let's thank God for his goodness to us, and uh, Vitaly's going to sing for us uh, during the offering, and so we're looking forward to that. Is that what you're going to do? Okay, he's going to sing a verse, and then he's going to go play a verse, and then he's going to come back, and now he's going to sing for us. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I heard he plays piano, and I think he's just, um, he's humble, and uh, he doesn't want to hurt anybody's feelings with, with how good he is. I, th I think that's what he does. That's, you know, that's why I don't play very much. I don't want to want to step on anybody's emotions and all that. But he's going to sing for us and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, the choir is starting their uh, cantata preparation on Sunday uh, in the, the fellowship hall at 4 o'clock. And so maybe you didn't let us know yet that you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, just a part-time basis. The next two months we'll work. Easter's two months away. And uh, I said to the choir a second ago, uh, Easter is on April 1st. Now, if you're a preacher and can't figure out how to turn that into a sermon title, you know, you probably need to go back to the basics. And so two months away. Uh, so meet us over there, 4 o'clock on Sunday, and uh, we'd love to have you and incorporate you in. And uh, you let us know how we can help you and want to be a real blessing. Tyler, lead us in prayer, will you please? And then we'll receive the offering here tonight. In 
earth I follow on the path neath the shadow of the cross. You freely gave so I could live. I count all Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you so much. Uh, let me give you two more things before we, uh, uh, Brother Jeremy comes and sings for us. Uh, I want you to have this. It's on the Welcome Center. Uh, you may, uh, some of you might be reading through the Bible. That's your goal this year, and uh, that's what you're doing for devotions, and I don't want to get in your way of doing that. But maybe the study I have here in my hands might be something that would be a help to you. This is John 15 and 16. So all the month of February, uh, you're just in the two chapters in the Gospel of John. And so if you'd like to have that, it's on the Welcome Center, and you can work through it just verse by verse and, and meditating on a shorter part of Scripture. And uh, I hope that you'll do that and uh, appreciate it so much. I was going to wait till uh, Sunday night. We'll have some pictures at that time. But uh, we helped Brother Trumpo get uh, I'd said two container ships, and that was true. I didn't have a number. 50,000 Bibles and 20,000 New Testaments. And uh, we got the pictures yesterday of uh, them unloading the, the, uh, the shipping containers. And uh, so those Bibles printed in Tennessee um, have gotten to the Philippines. And we rejoice in that. And so... Uh, you're going to meet Brother Lemon, who's responsible for the Bible side of it. And, of course, Brother Trumpo, we currently support. So I'll show you the pictures on Sunday night. And I just thought, man, I just, I've just got to tell them. We've been praying about that. And, of course, they were due to be there on February 1st. And I'll show you something else on Sunday night. Uh, Brother Gungampo sent me a picture uh, of that church meeting under that tree. And there they are. Uh, a group of believers under a tree. That's where they have church. And he said, we can put a, we can put a church building where that tree stands uh, for $5,000. And so we've, we've determined to do that. And, and by faith, we're going to help them uh, build that building. And uh, boy, I tell you what, God is just doing a great work all around the world. And we rejoice in it and we're thankful for it. And uh, where you think God is not working, he is uh, actively there. And we'll get into Ezra chapter 1 in just a moment. And you would think in the heart of a pagan potentate in Persia that God was up to nothing. But i got to tell you, as we've seen already, in one verse, God was up to something. 
And uh, so we'll look in God's Word in just a moment. And I appreciate Brother Jeremy. He's, he's been helping us for a long time. Appreciate his family, and God's blessed him in a great way. And so he's going to sing for us in just a moment. And I hope you have, I hope you have the lesson guide, Ezra chapter 1. We are tentatively going to finish the first chapter. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Brother Jeremy, come, will you please? house we build of make believe loved ones go long before seems it's time to leave but we will learn how to grieve to forgive city and on that day we will sing holy holy on that day we'll bow down in the light and then That's waiting there, and our minds can conceive all that He's prepared. There, the blind will see the sun. What is old will become young, and the land. They will run all over that city, and on that day we will sing holy, holy, on that day. Amen. Ezra chapter 1. I hope you have your Bible there. Ezra chapter number 1. Yes, I know it's the 1st of February. And yes, we're only two verses into our book study for the year. But there's no whiteboard tonight. <laughs> and there's some truths that we really needed to know before we went any further in our study. Now, knowing where we are in Scripture is always critical as we move forward, because the Bible was given in space and time. And our story, of course, took place uh, in a very important, very crucial time uh, in the history of the people of Israel. Now, the Jews might have been at this time counting the number of things against them. But for the spiritually wise and the endlessly perceptive, they could count the number of things that were in their favor. No, they didn't have a temple. No, they... They didn't have a political leader. No, they, they didn't have their homeland. No, they, they didn't have 
their homes and they didn't have a priesthood. I know there's a lot of things they didn't have. But if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen? And God has worked in a wonderful and mighty, mighty way. Now, I've entitled the lesson tonight, Someone Has to Be Willing to Go. Someone has to be willing to go. Notice in verse number 3. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts beside the freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things beside all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods. Even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, thirty chargers of gold, a thousand chargers of silver, nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, and four hundred and ten, and other vessels a thousand. And all the vessels of gold and of silver were five thousand and four hundred. And all these did Sheshbazar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. Now I want you to notice, by way of review tonight, the Word of God. The Word of God. The Bible says in verse number 1 that the mouth of Jeremiah is fulfilled here in the days of Ezra. Uh, that the Spirit, the Lord, had stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now the word of God was more powerful than any political, any military, any social movement of Ezra's day, as we looked at last week. There might have been political reasons that Cyrus let them go. There might have been practical reasons that he let them go. There might have been religious reasons that he let the people go, but he's really just a pawn in the hands of the sovereign God of the universe. And the word of God is being fulfilled. That's so important. That 150 years before Cyrus lived, before he ascended to the throne, before there was a Persian empire, God had put in the heart of Isaiah to declare that there would be a Gentile king that would let the people go after 70 years of bondage, and God said, I'm not just going to call the year and fulfill it twice, I'm going to call his name. And God, through Isaiah, said there's going to be a king whose name is Cyrus, and he's going to let the people go. We see the word of God. But then notice number two, the will of God. It is the will of God taking place here in our text. Notice verse two, Then saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me, what a word, he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now use your sanctified imagination for a moment and think of that word. The Lord God hath charged me. Now imagine we have here a Gentile king, a, a polytheist, an idolater. He has his own garden of gods that he worships. He is not a worshiper of Jehovah God, though he recognizes Jehovah's authority over the people of Israel and over the area of Canaan land. But God has charged him. That, that impulse has come into his spirit. There's a divine revelation taking place here. Imagine how that circumstances, circumstance developed in Cyrus's life. 
when God appears to him, Jehovah charges him to build him a house in Jerusalem. That's an amazing thing. What an amazing thought it is that God, you say, well, God speaks to his children. Hey, listen, God can speak whatever he wants to speak to anybody. And he put on his heart to build a house at Jerusalem. Now, there's two remarkable things I see here uh, by way of the will of God. Notice first, uh, in a work of remarkable grace, Cyrus realizes that all that he had was a gift from the God of heaven. Notice his language in verse 2. The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, I'd say to you tonight, that'd be a great revelation for all of us. That the Lord God of Israel has prospered us. That we're not self-made. We have been blessed by Almighty God. God has allowed His blessing to flow. Now notice the, the term He uses here. He says the Lord God. Now that's a power-packed combination of words there. The Lord God. Now you have here capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's the Jehovah. That's Yahweh. That's the covenant keeping name of God. That is the Jewish national name for God. He says the Lord. That's, that's the God that always keeps His promises. You study that name out in your Bible, you'll find when capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, when the Lord shows up, He's going to keep His word. He's going to keep His promise. He's the God who always shows up. He always keeps His word. And the man who is bringing the word to pass uses the authority of the name of the God who charged him to build a house in Jerusalem. Then he says God, Elohim. That's the, when we first meet God in the Bible, that's his name. In the beginning, God, Elohim. He's the Almighty. He's the God who can do anything. He's Jehovah Elohim. He's the covenant-keeping God that has all power. He uses that name. Now with ease, Cyrus had risen to power conquering the Babylonians and other armies in his way. But he says, not by power, not, not by might. It is the Lord God of heaven that hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Maybe he was so smart enough to read history and see what happened to his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar would, would do, he would not do what? He wouldn't arise and give God the glory. Maybe Cyrus made a mental note of that, and he said, maybe there is something to this idea that there's a God in Israel pulling all the strings. He's not just the king of kings. He's the God of all gods. So it's a miracle of grace. He says, God has prospered me. Now notice the second miracle. In a work of remarkable generosity, Cyrus restores the land of Judah to his captives. Now notice carefully. You have to come to the first determination to come to the second. Now when you come to the first realization, you'll come to the second. Now, we're coming up on missions conference. And what would we like God to impress on our hearts? We'd like Him to impress that remarkable work of grace that was working in Cyrus's heart where we would say, the Lord God of heaven has prospered us. Now, generosity springs out of a heart of gratitude for all that God has done for us. He realizes that he's merely a steward of the blessings and gifts of God. The fact is, we don't own anything. We don't own anything, but we are, we are stewards of what God has done for us. No, no doubt we see here that Cyrus has a gospel view of stewardship. He says to God, all that I am, all that I have become, all that I ever hope to be, the Lord God of heaven has done that in my life. Now notice here that this old idolater, this old polytheist, this worshiper of many gods... He, he did not expect God's covenant people to build a temple in Persia. Notice very carefully the language here, verse 2. And he charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? Let his, uh, his, his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Notice very carefully this this king did not ask the people to build a temple to Jehovah in the land of Persia. Now this revelation he had received of Jehovah dictated that Jehovah was to be worshipped by his people in his city Jerusalem with his holy vessels. 
Now you remember back to the Exodus when Moses was dealing with Pharaoh and he, he wants to go out into the wilderness, Moses does, and sacrifice with the people. Now, we'll look at this in a moment. It's kind of interesting as you contrast these historical figures, of Pharaoh and Cyrus, and how differently they responded to God. All Moses wants to do is go sacrifice to the Lord where the people of God can be the people of God. And so Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, we'd like to go sacrifice. And, and so Pharaoh gives him this compromise. It's found in Exodus 25, verse 8. And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. In other words, Pharaoh was willing to let them sacrifice in Egypt, but he was not willing to let them sacrifice out in the wilderness where they could be themselves. Now the reason for that was the Egyptians hated shepherds and the Egyptians hated sheep. And uh, in time, the children of Israel would offer bulls as sacrifice and they were worshipped. Bulls were worshipped in Egypt. And so Pharaoh says, you can worship here. And the people of God said, no, we're not doing that. We'll go worship God where we can worship in a holy and biblical way. It's interesting, is it not, that Cyrus says, I don't want you to build a temple here. I want you to go build a temple in Jerusalem. We see the will of God. Now, notice the key truth here. Cyrus knew the will of God. How does a Gentile king know the will of God? Or how can you tonight know the will of God? Did you know that every born-again, spirit-filled believer is equipped to knowing the will of God for their lives? You can know God's will. Now, how does he come to the determination of that? Number one, notice it carefully. He came to know it through the Word of God. Now, we looked at that the last couple weeks. Daniel, sitting there as an aged man, reading the gospel according to Jeremiah sees the fulfillment of this prophecy. Maybe Daniel's reading the writings of of Isaiah and he brings the writings of the prophets before the king and said, I want to show you what God's word has to say. The will of God is always in accordance to the word of God. If you want to know the will of God, get in the word of God. Now, number two, how does Cyrus know the will of God? Number two, he had the evidence of his life or circumstances. There was evidence in his life that proved to him that there was a God that was leading him. Circumstances. Circumstances. In our lives, there are no ironies. There's no happenstance. Everything that happens in our life is part of God's leadership in our lives. We ought to be so sensitive, shouldn't we? We ought to be so sensitive in our lives to see what God is doing, to see how God is speaking. When God brings people into our lives, circumstances into our lives. We ought to be looking for the Lord. You remember Mary? You remember Mary? The shepherds came after Christ was born. She'd heard the heavenly choir sing. Everybody went their way. And she's sitting there in a cattle stall holding a newborn baby. And the Bible says Mary kept all these things. She pondered them in her heart. What is she doing? She's seeing the will of God manifesting itself through circumstances. May God help us to see Him. And then number three, Cyrus came to know the will of God through other Christians. Men like Daniel and Ezra and other believers were used of God to lead him into the will of God. We see the Word of God and the will of God. But number three, I want you to notice in the balance of our time tonight, notice the workmen of God. Or who are these, verse three, who are these workmen that decide to pick up their stakes and go to the land of Israel to build a house for God. Notice, if you will, in verse number 5, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priest and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. Now we saw in verse number 1, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. And now here in verse 5, in whose spirit God raised to go up to build. You know what we find in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is a continual list of people whose hearts have been stirred by God to do something for Him. At the heart of our study is a group of people who experience God stirring, doing something in their heart. Now, Nehemiah called it a burden, and that's what it is. 
when God works in our heart to do something for Him, we ought to be sensitive to the leadership of God's Spirit in our lives. Number one, we see God working in people's hearts. You know, before God does something in our lives or before He wants to do something in our churches or in our families, before God begins the work, He begins the wooing, He begins the working in our hearts. You know, before God, before He builds the work, He prepares the workmen to do the work for Him. And God is working in their... I wonder tonight how God is working in your heart. I wonder what God is working in your heart. What are the desires that you have in your heart to do for Him? If anything's ever going to be done for God, there has to be a Christian who gets a burden to see God do something, to believe that God has a work to do in this world. Let me tell you, God has a work with your name on it. You ever thought about that? God has an eternal work with your name on it. He's working in the hearts of men. Then notice number two, God's people were willing. Verse three, who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord. Someone has to go. Somebody has to go. Someone has to say, yes, I'll go, Lord. Send me. A great and effectual door has been opened under the Jewish people through the edict of Cyrus. God has worked on their behalf, but somebody has to be willing to leave the comforts of home and do something with their lives for God. We're having a missions conference. Did you know that the church and the missionary are inextricably linked with each other? The church can raise as many faith promise dollars as they want to raise. They can't reach the world without the missionaries saying, Lord, send me and I'll go. And you got the missionaries somewhere in a meeting somewhere. God grabs their heart and rends their heart for the needs of a world lost and dying without Christ. And he says, Lord, send me, I'll go. But how, how can I get there unless someone buys into the burden? You see how linked we are in Christ? Somebody... Somebody has to be willing to give. Somebody has to be willing to go. Notice carefully. You and I will never know the bounty of God's preparing grace until we step out in faith. They will never learn. They will never find out. And you notice in your text, there would be Jews that would never be privy to the preparing grace of God. In other words, those who left the land of Persia, headed for the land of promise. They got, to do God, they got to see the Lord do some things in a mighty way. They saw Him provide. They saw Him move mountains. They saw Him topple giants. And only those who step out on faith get to see God do the impossible. In our Bibles, we think of Ruth, who just so happens to begin to glean in the fields of Boaz. But those who step out on faith see God's preparing grace. I thought about Paul's Macedonian vision in Acts chapter 16 when Paul was on his second missionary journey with Silas. And Paul had gone back after the meeting in uh, the city of Jerusalem, the preacher's fellowship. And he goes back to visit the churches he started on the first journey. And the Bible says the Spirit would not allow Paul to go preach in Asia. And so he looks at his map and he says, well, let's go to Bithynia. We haven't preached there yet. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, this, the Spirit of God, He suffered them not. Paul went to bed thinking, well, Lord, where should I go preach? You've forbidden me to preach in Asia. The Spirit has not suffered us to go into Bithynia. Paul laid his head on his pillow. And in that night vision, he saw that man over in Macedonia across the Aegean Sea. And that old Macedonian said, come over and help us. The next day they, they knew in their hearts that God had purpose that they cross the channel and go preach in Macedonia. And in our Bibles we have the book of Philippians. We have the books of the, to the Thessalonians. Paul goes to Mars Hill. He goes to the city of Corinth. He meets Timothy along the way. And Paul can say, I'm so glad I stepped out on faith and followed God and saw God preparing the way before me. Can you think about the children of Israel? who believed the promises of God in the wilderness and God allowed their eyes to see some awesome sights. Why? 
because there are some special blessings reserved for Christians who are willing to live and walk by faith. These Jews in Ezra chapter 1 would choose between the comforts of their captors or the life of faith and their conquest of Canaan. You can have the comforts of an average apathetic Christian life or you can experience the joys of living and working by faith. And notice what Cyrus says in verse number 3. Who is there among you of all his people? Let his God, here it is, his God be with him. I circled that in my Bible. Cyrus says if, if a man will just respond, his God will be with him. Can I just tell you here for a moment tonight, their confidence was not in Cyrus's decree, but it was in the God who promised to bless them. God said, go and I'll be with you. I'll lead and you follow. I'll pay the bills. You just, you just build the work and do what I've called you to do. We see God working in people's hearts. There must be someone that's willing to go. And then number three, notice, I want you to see this. God is always providing. God is always providing. Notice, if you will, in verse number 4, we have in verse 3 those who are willing to go. Those who are willing to get involved and do something for God. And Cyrus says, hey listen, if you don't get up in verse number 3, there's something for you to do in verse number 4. <laughs> Watch it carefully. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, beside the freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Verse number 3, go up to Jerusalem and build the house. Verse number 4, whosoever remaineth, let the men of his place help them. I want you to notice this expression. You as a Christian are going to do one of two things. You're either going to build something for God, or you're going to help somebody build something for God. I remember hearing my pastor say, probably once or twice a month, to us preacher boys, you're either going to start or pastor a church, or you're going to give your life helping somebody pastor a church. Well, that's good advice. Cyrus says in verse number 4, if you're not going to get up and do something for God and build something for God, why don't you at least open the checkbook and help somebody do a work for God? I want to be honest. I want to be honest. I like my house on South Glencoe Road in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, three and a half miles from the, from the ocean. I like where I live. How many of you like where you live? Have we loved the wintertime? No, we've whined like babies. We have whined like babies. I love where I serve. I, I, I even love the country of Samsula. I mean, I just like it. It's more than that. I, I feel called to it. I feel called to it. But we've got a brother who ministers in West Africa, Togo. Anybody want to go there and live? Raise your hand. Anybody want to move there next week? In Togo, you either help make clothes or you sell food at the market. It's hot year-round. They run electricity. It rarely works. So you, you have to buy your food every day. You can't depend on refrigeration. Anybody want to go there and build a house for God? Anybody want to go there? Now, I'd love to go see our missionaries in China someday. They've already asked me to come. I'd love to go. And I would go. But I don't think I want to go there without the call of God build a house for him. I would if he called me. But anybody want to go there tonight and live? Cyrus says, somebody has to be willing to go. Watch this. And somebody said, Lord, send me and I will go. I'll go and do what you want me to do. But there has to be somebody behind the scenes that says, you know what? I'll be willing to help send them there. I'll be willing to send them there. I'll be willing to encourage someone in their work for Christ. Did you know that all can give? I remember hearing years ago somebody said, all can pray. 
Some can give. And excuse me. All can pray. Some can give. Few can go. Did you know that really all of us can pray? All of us can pray. But I'll tell you this. All of us can give. Did you know that? We can't all give the same. But everybody can give. Did you know that all can go? Everybody in this room tonight can go with the gospel of Christ. Have you been around anyone lately who's unsaved? Have you been to the DMV lately? <laughs> There's people lost everywhere. Have you been to the doctor's office lately? There's sick people there. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody can be involved in doing what God wants us to do. Now notice here in our text, why would these people be willing to give to these Jews who are willing to turn from Persian life and head for the land of promise? Well, number one, I think those who were giving were giving, uh, the, the offerings were given by those who observed their good testimony. Now, these are not just any rank Jews who are heading back home. It says in verse 5, Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Benjamin and uh, Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up. The, these are the cream of the crop, as we might say. They observed their good testimony. And then think about this. There were some Persians and Jews who opened their wallets to sponsor this work because God had not just worked in the heart of Cyrus to let the people go. God had worked in Jewish and Persian hearts to give money to the effort. We call it faith promise giving. There's another word we can use for it. You study 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, you'll find the word over and over and over again used, the word grace. It's grace giving. Where God does a work of grace in our hearts when we realize that we are living on higher means than necessary and others have never heard the gospel of Christ. But God's work in our hearts. And then, of course, this decree to give by free will offerings. Now I want you to notice a second key truth in the box here. Think, think quickly about Cyrus as the king of Persia and Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt, for just a moment. Isn't it interesting? We see three distinct contrasts here in these characters. Both fellows let the people of Israel go. Notice carefully, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Remember that? He hardened his heart. Every plague continually hardened Pharaoh's heart until eventually God took the firstborn son of the Pharaoh to get his attention that there's only one God to be worshipped. But notice here, Cyrus, God softened his heart. In the second place, God destroyed Pharaoh's kingdom. But in the case of Cyrus, God, he says here in chapter 1, built his kingdom. In the case of Pharaoh, the Egyptians paid the Israelites to leave. But in the last case, the Persians gave free will offerings to the Jews. What was the difference between Pharaoh and Cyrus? Well, it's the difference with all of us. It was their reception to the Word of God. Cyrus obeyed the revelation of God while Pharaoh disobeyed. Can I tell you, whether you're a pauper on the street or a prince in the palace, it's always better to obey God. Now, who are these workmen as we close? Who are these Jews that arise from their lives in Persia to return to the land of Israel to do a work for God? I say, number one, they were those who had a proper perspective. Notice the word in verse 5, the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin. As we'd say in this day and time, they were some old timers. There's some good old fashioned old time religion Jews in the midst of that crowd that said, you know, this country is not our home. We belong in Jerusalem. Now, you might read the book of Esther and discover that there were many Jews that had established a pretty decent life in Persia. 
They had homes there. They had jobs there. Because of the way Cyrus has treated them, they're not being persecuted as they previously had been under Nebuchadnezzar. They're living a fairly comfortable life. But these workmen had a proper perspective. We'd, br- we'd rather be poor in the place of God's will than we would with the riches of this world living in a pagan land. They had, they had a right perspective. They had a right perspective. And then I thought about this, those who had a proper, those who had proper priorities. Proper priorities. What do you mean? Well, notice what Cyrus said. Verse 3. Notice it again. Who is there among you of all his people? Let God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, which is in Jerusalem. Cyrus didn't say, I'm looking for someone to revitalize the downtown of Jerusalem. I'm looking for someone to go back and rebuild the infrastructure of that once great city. It's not what he said. He didn't say, I'm looking for tenants for the palatial condos on the Mount of Olives overlooking Mount Zion. That's not what he said. Cyrus said, I'm looking for someone to go up to Jerusalem and to build the house of God. And somebody said, I'm willing to leave everything I have in Persia Now keep in mind, they're going back to a city that's lying in rubble. When Nebuchadnezzar came through, he absolutely destroyed the temple down to its foundations. They're going back, if you've seen uh, in the news, uh, some of the cities of Syria, Aleppo, for example. I don't know if you've seen that city, that war-ravaged city. That's what the Hebrews are going back to. A devastated city, a rancid city, a destroyed city, devastated by war. They said, you know what? We're willing to go back and build the house of God. Because at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. These good Jews left behind the lives that they had built in Persia to pioneer a work for God in the land of Israel. They proved, they proved that they had placed God's work in proper priority in their lives. You know, tonight, as we think about these Hebrews, we ought to think about what's most important in our lives. What's most important in our lives? I got that picture. I, I told the Brother Gungampo, I said, I want you to send me a picture of those people. Not that I didn't believe him, not that I needed proof. I just wanted to see them. I wanted to see their faces. I wanted to see that tree. I wanted to see that congregation the size of this one. And I was walking outside and my phone flashed and he'd sent me a picture. I walked back through double doors, brand new $1,500 glass security doors. Walked on new tile into the foyer. Walked into my office with a leather couch with recliners in it. I never use it, but I like it. Sat down at my desk. I just started looking around. And I was so convicted. And I just said, dear God, help us to build a house. Help us to build a house. In in a very small way, God reminds us from time to time what's really important. Now, we all understand that a church is not a building. But that's easy for us to say when we're sitting in a pretty nice one. Amen. Amen. Preacher said we we need another church building. It's at a church in the downtown area, the capital city. He said, we've got to build a a building. I said, well, why? He said, well, this one's going to cost $15,000. I said, what's wrong with that one? He said, well, he said, it's it's by a wooded lot. And he said, "We, we have a weekly problem with poisonous snakes slithering into the meeting. Our people have been bitten during the services and 
some ha haven't been coming back to church because of the danger of snakes. I thought, yep, that's, that'd be my problem. <laughs> that would be my problem. Somebody has to be willing to go. And somebody has to be willing to give. As is the case with Nehemiah, somebody has to be willing to pray. Somebody has to get a burden. May God work in our hearts to rise up. May God stir in us. May, may we rise up. We have, we have so many cream of the crop young people in our church. They're on this platform every week. And they're great. I like all of them. Well, except for, but we won't get into that. I like all of them. But you know what? Some of them, some of them need to find out what God wants them to do and they need to go. Because there's a whole world out there. Brother Les was telling his nephew last night, he said, I guess there's 12 pianists in that church. I hope I wasn't in that number, by the way. He said, how do you use them all? I said, well, we, we just we fit them in. We fit them in. And that's great. We love it. But when God works in your heart, I remember sitting in a church in the Bible Belt. I grew up on the buckle of the Bible Belt. 350 independent Baptist churches in the city of Knoxville. 450 Southern Baptist churches in the greater Knoxville area. You'd go down the street, you'd see Hope Baptist Church. You'd go down about a tenth of a mile, and you'd see New Hope Baptist Church. You'd go a little further, and you'd see Blessed Hope Baptist Church. I mean, they're everywhere. Everywhere. First Baptist, Second Baptist, Third Baptist right on down the line. And I remember, I remember seeing all that, being a part of that. I said, Lord, send me somewhere. Send me somewhere where I'd be needed. Send me somewhere. Now, I'm not saying it wouldn't be the call of God on somebody's life, don't misunderstand me, but I've, I've heard people say, well, I believe God wants me to go start a church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, I'm not going to say he didn't. But you know what? There, there are masses. There are masses of people all around the world. There are masses of people right here in this country. There are cities. Cities in our, in our state do not have a church that preaches the Bible, preaches salvation by faith in Christ. Somebody has to go and do what God wants them to do. And I found if somebody's willing to get up and go, God, God will work on somebody's heart to make sure the work of God is financed in the right way. We have a great God, don't we? Let's pray together. Is God working in your heart? Is he working in your heart? Someone, someone with a proper perspective, someone with proper priorities says, I want my life to count for eternity. I want my life to count for eternity. I want to make a difference for eternity. I wonder where God would send us if we would go. I've heard it said so many times before and I believe it be true. Why would we pray that God would send someone around the world if God can't trust us to go across the street? Lord, send me. I'll go. I'll go. Is God working in your heart? I can't tell you how often lately God has worked in my heart. Just about reaching our Jerusalem, our area, our city, our, our county. What more can we do to reach this place for Christ, to preach the gospel?
Could we at least say, may God help us to at least expose everyone to the gospel? Can we at least give them the right to reject it? Because somebody has to go. Father, I thank you and I praise you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for this week. I thank you for this ministry. Lord, I thank you for what you did in the school this week. I thank you for what you've done through our ministries. I thank you for how you provided for us this week. I thank you how you've led us. I thank you for each person who's come here tonight. Holy Spirit, will you take us and, and Lord, stir us. Stir us, we pray. Help us to make a difference. And we thank you and praise you for we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's stand together, may we? And we'll be dismissed. If you need any questions answered about the uh, banquet, I'll be here after church. And uh, would like to help you if you want to volunteer for a table. I'll be here if you can help us. We appreciate that. Uh, in a big way. Amen. Let's pray for each other and love each other. Tell someone hello if you didn't get to speak to them yet here tonight. Thank these, thank these guys for singing for us tonight. And always, uh, just let them know that you appreciate uh, their efforts and, and be a blessing. So God bless you. Please be careful going home. Uh, 10 o'clock on Saturday, 9 for Sunday school, Sunday. We'd love to have you in one of our classes, all right? God bless you as you go. Thank you.